we'll look forward to going through this. Okay, first of all, uh, one of the things that's impressive about the air-cooled condensers, as most of you know, is how how large they are. And something that's very large obviously has a a lot of areas to to look for leaks. It's uh, outdoors. Much of the uh, air and leakage uh, testing uh, could be some indoor stuff, but but largely outdoors, and that presents another challenge with the environment. Um, the air, of course, leaks into the vacuum created by the ACC. There's a couple of examples on the left, uh, some holes at the bottom of some fin tubes, and uh, the right is some uh, rupture discs that, uh, if they're not closed correctly, it can, can be a source of in-leakage. And again, uh, from the interior, some holes on the uh, left side and a and, uh, sample of uh, there's some weld cracking on the right. All right, so just one of the things that uh, to remember, uh, indoors when we do helium air and leakage testing, um, it's easy. We spray, there's no currents, uh, very little currents. Helium drifts over, encompasses the leak, and we can uh, tell there's something there. Then we can go closer and, and narrow it down. Uh, when we're outdoors, if there's even a little bit of air, a couple of miles an hour, just a, a slight breeze, uh, the helium can be blown off track very easily, uh, meaning what you have to do is be really close to the leak with the helium. And then getting back to that uh, initial picture with the, the huge size of the structure and all the possible leak places, uh, it's a challenge. And I know there's interest in how, how leaks are detected and, and who does it. And I know there's people that do it and, and do it well, but the point is it's a, it's a much more challenging process than we're used to with uh, with water cooled units and working indoors. Uh, air and leakage can happen at unexpected locations. And uh, this is just an example of, you don't really expect the wall of the condenser, it's a wet cooled condenser to crack, but but uh, it can happen in a couple of cases where there's there's leaks in those. And, um, and this is on the inside, there's a patch on the inside, not on the outside, uh, but there's a leak. So. But the point is, with this huge structure, um, you can see in the lower left, there's a frack tank. You know the size of a frack tank. Um, everything is big. Uh, getting access to these, these joints, uh, flexible joints on the riser tubes. Uh, everywhere that there is to say, there's, in this example here, there's something like 20,000 uh, tubes, fin tubes. There's, that means 40,000 welded connections. Just a lot of lot of potential for leaks, and uh, generally we see more air coming into an air cold condenser, more leaking in than than with water cold condensers. It's just because there's so many so many uh, places, and it's so difficult to to pin them down. Okay, strategies. Just a few quick one more slide strategies. Uh, have the fans in the vicinity off. You need to have it running to pull the vacuum, pretty much, but but uh, fans in the vicinity will stir up the air and cause trouble. The, the, the air needs to be relatively still. Uh, even if you're a foot away from a leak, uh, it's not necessarily gonna be easy to pick it up if there's much breeze going on. Uh, plan on getting comprehensive access. And if, if, you, if you can find a leak and plug it and move on, that's, then you, you may solve your problem early. But if, if not, you have to be able to use uh, lifts to get to locations and and ladders in the right look there's just a lot of stuff to that's necessary to get close to those leaks some of the alternatives we had quite a few questions about alternatives and i appreciate input from people on this uh, infrared testing where where air is leaking in it should show a cooler cooler area uh, acoustic testing is is another option it's if if the acoustics can pick out a leak over the uh, the background noise of uh, the fans running on the ACC, that, that can be useful. There may be other methods that uh, people have that they can suggest. Um, and I don't really wanna talk, I think we know that the air and leakage has these effects, can cause steam blanketing and block off areas of the air ACC and increase the back pressure in a, in a unit with uh, feed water heaters and deaerate or a conventional unit, it can, it can cause uh, performance loss in those and then chemistry controls another major effect oxygen gets in 
uh, carbon dioxide can uh, can enter the system and and particularly throw off some of the measurements that we rely on for steam psychochemistry. Okay, so this is a part we're uh, trying to get to the discussion, and these are some of the items that were that were mentioned and. What I'm going to do is I'll read the item. If I have a comment or two, that's fine. Then I'm going to uh, hopefully hear from some of you. I know there's people with good expertise in this and also people who struggle with it. So uh, first item on the list, the, the effect of the ACC on condensate dissolved oxygen. And, and, uh, and there's also comments on what, what does it mean if the oxygen is increasing, but uh, the vacuum appears normal. So um my only comment on this is is uh oxygen obviously can go up if there's a, a leak it's uh, particularly particularly higher if it's leaking into an area where there's condensate if it's in an area that's mostly vapor uh, steam phase it has an opportunity to to leave with the air removal system but if it if it gets into the condensate such as if it's bubbling into into a liquid then oxygen can really be picked up at a high high level. So uh, any comments on uh, on the dissolved oxygen in, in the ACC and and uh, what you see or what you what you have problems with? And dissolved oxygen in itself may or may not be a significant issue uh, to your system, depending on how much oxygen is in there and how you're running the system. But uh, carbon dioxide comes with it, and and that's uh, in some ways that's more of a concern for for chemistry monitoring because it will it will add to the to the uh, the cation conductivity or the the uh, uh, conductivity after cation exchange. It will add to that those numbers and and then it then it's necessary to identify where the where the increase came from whether it's a contamination from another uh, corrodent source like uh, chloride or sulfate or whether it's it's from the carbon dioxide so so both of those issues can be can be significant we we prefer not to have oxygen come in randomly prefer to control oxygen otherwise so it's it's uh, it's an effect that's major. I've I've seen some really high oxygen numbers in some units with a lot of leaks. Yeah. So Andy, can I make a comment? Yes, please. So um, I I think it's dependent upon the type of unit. Uh, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be so worried about dissolved oxygen in a combined cycle in a combined cycle plant, but in a conventional plant, uh, subcritical or subcritical then the in the, that large uh, in leakage could cause us not to be able to operate the unit optimally and allow it to close the vents on the deaerator and the heaters so it depends upon, it depends upon what uh, you know type of unit it is right okay good I, I would also comment on this second aspect increase someone is experiencing increasing oxygen with uh, with no no difference in the vacuum uh, as I mentioned, if if there's a very small leak, but it's it's bubbling into a liquid into liquid condensate, um, that could cause a significant increase in in oxygen, uh, where it may not have been enough to enough uh, in leakage to notice otherwise in the system. That's that's my only really my only thought on that. Okay, let's uh, talk about the next one. How to do helium detection testing effectively on ACC2 bundles. I just kind of described the uh, uh, challenges of that. Uh, so anyone? Hey, Andy? Yeah. This is Jeff Peter. Before you move on from that, I'm just curious, when you say high oxygen levels, are, are you talking 40 ppb, 100 ppb? You know, how high of oxygen level are would you at? expect to see if you've got leaks in your ACC? I've, I've seen, if you can believe, I've seen as high as 600 ppb at a unit where they had a lot of leaks and weren't addressing them. But I would say uh, normally it would be less than 100 and probably more in the, the uh, 20 to 40 range. So it, 
a little bit high. That's usually what you would see. The other, the other question I'd have, where if you've got air in leakage, you see uh, cation conductivity going up, where would you get the sulfates and chlorides that, that you mentioned if if on the steam side it's you know there's or on the on the on the cooling side there, there's no water, there's no cooling cooling water going through there. Right. Really really the, the major source of contamination for ACCs would be uh, makeup water. If there's a problem with that, in, including potentially the uh, a decomposition of uh, anion resin, which which is a little more likely with ACCs as the temperature tends to be higher, or uh, or possibly if there's something in your if you're feeding ammonia or an, or an amine that that has a little bit of uh, contaminants in it. that, and that's about it. No, you're right. If it's ACCs are not near as prone to to those contaminations, but uh, but they can happen and they can be major. There's a unit in, uh, there's a one unit that I'm aware of that had a LP turbine blade uh, corrosion cracking and, and really severe that had no no water support. Re regeneration of the resin is another another possibility where some contaminants could get in, but it, it can happen. Okay. Uh, We'll try to move on since we have shortage of time here, but uh, helium test detection testing effectiveness. Uh, I know some companies do that do effective uh, testing, but my understanding is it takes quite a bit longer uh, to do that on an ACC and and is not always successful either. So any any comments on helium detection and how it can be done well, other than what I kind of described earlier, getting as close as you can to the leak. And that can involve using a very long uh, wand, uh, maybe climbing up a little bit. You know, the tubes are 30, 30 foot, 10 meters long. That's uh, a pretty long, long uh, wand to be sticking up near the top of the tubes. But uh, something like that may be, may be necessary or may be necessary to go slowly with a ladder. Uh, can, take, can take a week to, to do this, maybe longer from your experience, but but uh, it's not like doing a test in a day on a an indoor environment. So obviously it's more costly as, as well. Probably uses more helium as well, spraying more helium at a at a higher rate to, to make that happen. Um Andy? Yeah. Uh the one of the first things I, I would mention is uh uh really good measurement of the exhaust coming off the steam jet air ejector, uh, you know, and maintaining a vigilance with that on a daily basis to know whether it's increasing or not. And once it is with the testing, uh, with the probes, uh, I, I think one of the best things is, uh, to do is, uh, you know, document the first test or all the tests that you have because typically it seems that the leaks that show up are in the same places uh, uh, where vibration occurs at the deflag sections, uh, the beginning and the end of the deflag sections. Uh, the problem with, with the air is really not that big a deal if you have an effective way of uh, moving the probes, and uh, it, you can go back to the same units and find the same leaks sometimes after they've been repaired. Uh, but uh, going room to room, shutting a fan down, spraying the room uh, at the base of the tubes, and just basically you're filling the room up uh, is quite effective. It's that is time consuming, but once you get in a groove, you can move from room to room and uh, experience uh, tells you if it's not even in the room, that if it's above on a weld, on a deep leg piping, uh, that, that you really kind of get a feel for 
where where it's going you know you know okay I, i'm not pinpointing it here i can see it on a number of bundles uh, of tubes uh number of tubes that it's actually leaving the room but uh you can find them at the base uh sometimes uh you you can't shut the fans down it's too hot or uh they're not willing to and even then as long as you get the probe effectively at the tube welds and even at some of the places where the tubes are uh being held in place uh mid-range you can find uh weather related you know free tube freezing cracking uh, both at the bottom and the top, even with the fans blowing. Uh, just have to make sure you have a chin strap for your hard hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great, great comments. I'd also point out that I've seen ACCs where the uh, the barrier between rooms was not uh, complete and, and gaps were like, like the, the upper area was open, uh, which would, if you turn your fan off and the one next door is running, it's going to pull your helium over there and you're you're going to have confusing results on that but but yeah that's that sounds like a, a really helpful thing one other thing i should mention is you do not start with the acc this you would start with with looking at the indoor thing looking at the the seal indoor looking at the, the turbine i guess the turbine could be outdoor but look at turbine uh, rupture discs and seals if you start with the acc and and the real problem is is elsewhere uh, you you may have wasted a lot of time, and also if you if you find a major thing, fix it, and at the, on the spot or as soon as possible, and then then uh, it will clarify if there's other if there's really other leaks or if that was the main leak and and that sort of thing. Um, have normal or alternative methods, and as I mentioned, the uh, helium is pretty much normal. I think alternative methods. Uh, infrared now an infrared camera can be great for screening as well uh, if you see something then you would follow up with helium to check it at those specific locations um, not don't have a lot of experience with it I know some people are, are very confident in it and I know the acoustic has been used uh, I'm familiar with one application where it's been very successful but I'm I'm not totally sure uh, sure how widely applicable it is because I, I believe in that case they shut the unit down routinely and and hold the vacuum and look for leaks with everything off uh, so the sound is is uh, the background noise is low uh, but any other comments on those alternative methods if you've had uh, good luck or hasn't worked or what yes uh, one of the things is just a uh, really simple method uh, is while you're waiting for the helium to clear out from a leak, you can use uh, just a temperature probe, you know, laser pointed, really inexpensive. You don't need to go wild, uh, but uh, that's been particularly helpful. Uh, and even, you know, you're taking a couple of minutes uh, for the helium to clear out maybe, and you can use that. Uh, and that's effective too. Uh, plant down, uh, in Texas, uh, very quickly, we were getting a response up underneath the ACC on the uh, condensate removal piping. And uh, it was four different flanges that were leaking that we uh, we didn't need to use a JLG or anything, a lift to get up there. Just by pointing it at it, we knew right away. They, they had to go up and tighten the bolts on it. It was a new unit. But that's something that's just quick and easy. Uh, backing up just briefly, uh, uh, your comment was right on with make sure you find all the leaks on the ground, uh, on the turbine, on down, everything there, because uh, uh, that can answer a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, as also as far as dissolved oxygen, but also uh, been on a number of units where they wanted to go straight to the ACC because they were seeing subcooling or this or that up on the ACC, and they were sure that the leaks were up there, uh, which they weren't. There was a huge a number of times, huge leaks down below. Uh, but that, that also adds 
the indication, it gives them an indication later on if they develop a big leak below that it's going to affect a certain row of tubes, a uh, certain uh, number of bundles. So, but I, yeah, you, you can't clarify enough that finding all the leaks below is uh, important. Okay, well, we're, we're uh, we got just a couple of minutes left. I wanted to add, mention this one about the the last one about vacuum decay less leak test frequency. I've heard, I've heard I uh, optimal advice of checking it every uh, three months. I think um, if you're showing air and leakage come high air and leakage out the air ejector, that's another good thing. But it's really good to have a a uh, baseline on that, especially you. You had that when the, the unit was first started up. Uh, if you do it routinely, then it's then it becomes co comes clear what's going on. Any any comments on the ACC uh, vacuum decay leak testing frequency? I know people tend to not do it if they don't see a problem, but it's good to it's good to keep it on a steady steady testing frequency and when you sh when you shut down is the best time to to uh, cl keep things closed up and see how quickly it leaks out. Andy, this is Jeff Peters again, just trying to wrap my arms around what's normal and what's not normal. Uh, obviously, uh, ACC is not going to be theoretically as tight as a, a you know, surface condenser uh, water cooled. What what's What's normal oxygen level on, quote, a tight uh, ACC unit? Um, I'm not sure, Barry. Do you have any comments on what might uh, be expected? Well, again, again, uh, Jeff, it depends upon what type of unit it is. Uh, we usually like to have uh, at the condensate pump uh, less than 10 ppb of oxygen, uh, which would be the normal level. Uh, I think you can equilibrate that across all the different types of unit, but like we were saying before, if 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 it's uh, elevated, you know, from the ACC or like Al was saying from uh, from the steam turbine uh, parts before the ACC, it would be it would be higher. But normal, normally unachievable is usually less than ten ppb. Okay, that's so that is that's normal and achievable. All right, thank you. Okay, well, we're at 1030. Uh, these, I just wanted to remind you that uh, the the uh, website does have a uh, forum where you can put out uh, questions and and uh, there's, I don't know, the last time I remember there was several hundred at least on that available. Uh, people will get an email and respond to questions if they, they have an answer. And so if some of these didn't get answered or you have further follow ups on them, uh, we may have time later on here, but uh, I'm thinking we probably won't. We've got quite a bit to go. So, so uh, and, and Andy, there's, there's, one, there's, one, there's one, one quick comment okay. uh, from uh, Jose Juan Rivera. He says, uh, basically, you can compare real vacuum against the theoretical. This approach is useful with low wind speed. Okay. Okay, well, we can, uh, yeah, we can clarify that as needed later, but that's, I appreciate that comment. Okay, Barry, I think we can, uh, you can share. Andy, we've yeah. got two two hands raised from oh. uh, <laughs> Sabello and Chris Roof, so I guess, Sabello, you can unmute yourself first. Okay, uh, morning, morning, Andy. Before you leave, I uh, wanted to check. I uh, understand sometime last year you and the team were working on putting together the guideline for a leakage uh, detection in the air cool condensers. Uh, is this guideline available now? When can we expect? You know, the, uh, the guidelines heavily dependent on my getting around to it, and I've been negligent. I'm expecting to have a a really good draft by the meeting in September. Uh, need to finish it up. It should be a priority. So it's um, it's going to be going to move forward in the near future. It's not not much different than the draft you last saw at this point. 
Thank you, Andy. Okay. I I have a question. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, the problem during the ECC uh, power plant uh, in the startup. The startup uh, oxygen level is very high until the vacuum system working. In this case, uh, uh, the very high uh, oxygenated water uh, uh, goes through uh, to the boiler. And I have a limitation about this limit of the oxygen in the water inside the boiler. What is the ideal case for this case? Because it, I think this problem for yani, in our country for all ECC uh, power plant. You're talking about how, how quickly uh, with frequent startups or with a, just on a, a occasional startup? Um, yeah, there, there will be high oxygen. a cold startup. Of the cold startup. Cold startup. Uh, 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 cold startup, especially we didn't use oxygen for the type of. Uh, and how, how, uh, how quickly would it go down typically with how, how long would it take the oxygen to return to limits uh, sometimes too long uh, yani very long time yani more than sometimes yani more than uh, days it seems like it should be the uh air removal system should be active in, and working and lowering it quicker than that. So I'm, I'm not really sure what the, but you said it's a widespread problem. Um, it sounds like an air in leakage problem, Andy. And not, and not, could just, be. Not, and not just a normal yeah. startup situation. Yeah, there, there was mention of, of, um, of what, what we see in air and leakage and being not as maybe not as tight as a water cooled system and my my observation is that every time i look at uh, every time i visit a plant and ask how the air and leakage is they say it's fine and when i look at the uh, air ejector it's pegged out so it, it seems like uh, it's typically high quite a bit higher uh, in accs in general to me but uh, they we had one other question uh, Mr. Yeah, I'm oh, more, right. of, more of a comment on leak detection. Um, we've probably found 80 to 90 percent of our leaks just visually on a, on a shutdown because most of our leaks occur in the steam headers um, where they are the bottom of the troughs are welded together. And we do a lot of say we do a, a fair amount of cold weather startups. And I think that's where our our cracks come from, but on, upon shutdown, we normally do a, a walk down of the HCC area and we could find con when the uh, steam condenses, we find uh, leaks dripping down through and that's how we find most of our leaks. Okay, I will note that it's not recommended to flood the ACC to look for leaks. Um, we didn't you know flood that. when the steam yeah. condenses, it turns into water. Yeah, no, I, I realize that. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Andy, there's a few, a few more questions. Maybe we'll come back to them at the at the end if we have some yeah, time. Yeah, there's a lot of questions and um, they keep coming. And feel free to ask those questions that we may, uh, we may uh, respond to them uh, separately if our meeting uh, doesn't have time, but appreciate your questions and inputs. All right. Yeah. So can we, can we, can we, uh, are we, are we, are we going to move ahead? Yes, Barry, go ahead. Okay. So, um, uh, if Scott just let me, oh yeah, here we go. Okay. So just hold on a minute. I'm just going to stop that. I'm going to stop the video. So we have better, better bandwidth. And uh, we're going to go to here. Should be um, 
this should be okay, Scott, right? Looks good to me. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to talk for um, uh, the next period on the corrosion and cycle chemistry uh, section. And uh, uh, what I've done, uh, what I've done here is I've uh, based um, a, a few slides here, ten slides I think, uh, based on the questions that were submitted with the registration. Uh, there were a few common themes, and so hopefully I can just cover those and at least uh, introduce them so that we can have some uh, questions. And uh, some of these things, um, you know, I I, I always have uh, covered. At all the previous ACCUG meetings since 2008, I've provided um, an introduction and background on on uh, the chemistry and corrosion parts, as they as they're so important. And uh, so I'm going to use a few a few of those slides. I apologise to people who are regular attendees, but um, as always, when we have these ACC meetings, there's a large percentage of the participants. That have never been to an ACC, uh, and that was quite clear from some of the questions. So let's um, so let's move ahead, and uh, let me see if I can find a pointer here. Here's a pointer. So um, so I'm, I've shown this slide before. Uh, ACCs uh, come in uh, in all different, in many different sizes. But what we find is, um, or what I've found is, wherever I go, and these are some of the countries that that I worked in on inspections and helping organizations with the ACC, but the but the flow accelerated corrosion and corrosion damage is the same worldwide, with all the different chemistries and and uh, and plant types. So we can sort of generalize here. So these are the items that I'm going to uh, try to uh, try to discuss. Uh, I'm going to remind people of the damage that we see in an ACC and how this is normally addressed. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, because there was a lot of questions about it, about the recent introduction of film forming substances and some of the international experience. And if we get time, we'll talk about some of some of the missing, some of the missing information. And so, first of all, the, the, uh, let's just remind ourselves about about uh, what what uh, the damage uh, looks like in uh, in ACCs, it's it's this it's basically the same wherever we see it. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here. Uh, the uh, the susceptible locations are in the um, are in the tube entries. These are the tube entries in the upper duct, and you can see these white areas at the tube entries. Basically, the more white areas, the worse is the corrosion and FAC. And the higher the level of iron that you will find in the condensate and going round and going round the cycle, we developed a corrosion index uh, uh, years ago, more than ten years ago now. Uh, and the higher the number from one to five, the worse is the corrosion in FAC. So you can see this is a DC a DC of four, quite a, quite a high level. Here's another here's another one. You can see again the same sort of thing. A different type of unit. The first one was a combined cycle. This is a supercritical unit, but you can see that the damage concentrates um, underneath the support structure here, and the white areas are, are right, are right um, here. We learned um, we learned many years ago, uh, more than fifteen years ago, that you can arrest this or switch this damage off by operating at IPH levels. Uh, sometimes as high as pH of eight of nine point eight, you can see the damage beforehand uh, right here with a with a high DC index, uh, and then two years with the pH of nine point eight, you'll see that the that the FAC at the tube entries has arrested, and now you're down to a DC of two, so very good level, and this will be accompanied by. A, a large decrease in the amount of iron transported into the um, in, in into the unit, but it takes it takes some time to do this. We don't really know how long it takes because we don't do an inspection every week. We typically do it every couple of years, and so that's why we say two years here. 
here's another here's another example. These are both examples that have been presented at the ACCUG over the years. You can see the original condition here, operating with pH of nine, the high DC index, and uh, uh, after uh, two inspection periods, 15 months apart, with a pH of 9.8, you can see that the, the damage at the tube entries has essentially arrested. We also, we also are starting uh, to notice uh, most recently at ACCUG and in the industry around the world that um, organizations are adding a film forming substance uh, to it and, uh, and, and this will cause a reduction in the DACI index, as you can see here. This was the original case at pH of 9 or 9.1. And then after a certain period using the, uh, an FFS and added to the normal chemistry, you can see that the tube entries have, um, have, uh, have rested. So uh, for those of you that asked what the corrosion looks like and uh, how, how, you can, how you can quantify it, I, I hope that gives you a little bit of introduction. The next little section that I want to address is um, on film forming substances. And um, um, this is um, uh, being, being used now. There's basically two film forming, two areas of film forming substances, amine based uh, here, film forming amines or film forming uh, products. Uh, and these are proprietary, non-amine, non-amine based. The film forming amines, the active ingredients, there's three of them. They're given, they're given right here, ODA, OLA, and o OLDA. And these are the ones used around the world. And uh, if anybody wants to um, see any guidance, there, there is a set of IAPS technical guidance documents for film forming substances, which are freely available and downloadable on the IAPS, on the IAPS website. Now, although, although this looks um, although this looks pretty simple, the situation worldwide is getting uh, rather complicated, and uh, now uh, we just prepared this for uh, an IAPS meeting uh, last September, and also for the film forming substance uh, conferences. You can see here that there is at least uh, ten different types of uh, of um, uh, of film forming substance. Uh, from the uh, these three here are amine based, and this is non-amine based, and these are the these are the various applications. I don't really have time to go through this, but when do we have so many? When we have so many of them, this wide range of film forming substances makes the application um, a, a, a little bit more difficult because you have to choose whether you're going to have an amine or a non-amine. And whether you're going to have it uh, pH or surfactant stabilized, or or with an emulsion, or stabilized with 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 dispersants, and uh, this also translates into the um, this also translates into the um, the suppliers of of film forming substances, and uh, based on the IAPS uh, film forming substance international conferences. There's, there's currently at least 10 uh, manufacturers uh, and suppliers of them in these uh, in these uh, same in these same categories so a little bit uh, uh, complicated so uh, uh, that introduces you to the film forming substances that are available I just thought it might be useful just to give you a few um, uh, 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 give you a few of the highlights um, IAPS is Organized as many of you know, five film forming substance conferences, and from these, and from the publication of the IAPS uh, guidance documents, and from the assessments that, uh, that, that 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 I do, there's a couple of key aspects. I think that we can say that the basic understanding has improved worldwide uh, since 2014, and what we see is a or a universal reduction in uh, condensate and feed water iron, uh, only iron for the AC for the units with ACC. But uh, although we see this reduction in iron, there's really no equivalent understanding of, of exactly what the mechanism is on the oxide growth uh, that occurs in the condensate and the feed water. 
there's general observation of uh, hydrophobic films on uh, water touch surfaces, but it's on the line and seen very often that that hydrophobicity does not prove the presence of the film or the pore protection. Um, the film formation and absorption remains very questionable on steam touch, on superheated steam touched surfaces. It works obviously in saturated steam surfaces because there's water there. And, uh, and what we see is still, we still see problems around the world. And these problems uh, appear uh, to be slightly increasing. They're not openly published. Would, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples, a couple of examples of them. So the first one that we see is an increasing amount of uh, heavy deposits and failures. Actually, in the in the HRSG uh, HP evaporator tubing, as you can see right here, and uh, and sometimes this will result in serious under deposit corrosion, which is shown at the bottom here. And when we look at these in detail, you'll see this multi laminated structure, which is typical in this case of uh, hydrogen damage. And we see this we see this quite often, and uh, we're starting also to see uh, increases of deposits uh, after the application of, of film forming substances. So this here on the left hand side would show the deposits on the internal surfaces of HP evaporator uh, tubing. Um, and uh, when we did the assessment in uh, 218, the total loading was about uh, up to 22 grams per foot squared, nearly approaching the level where you would have to think about chemical cleaning. Uh, but then uh, two years later, after application of a film forming product, a non amine uh, proprietary product, then you can see that the loading has increased quite, uh, quite markedly. And uh, the final one, uh, which has always been there ever since uh, ODA was used as the first uh, film forming substance many years ago, we see this gunk formation. Uh, so this is an example in an LP drum. You can see there's dark areas, and um, and 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 you can remove this as is shown in the hand here. Uh, some uh, some gunk uh, de uh, deposits. So there are some there are some uh, uh, things that you have to think about uh, when you um, when you think about applying film forming substance. And and I just put a couple of uh, uh, conclusions here together uh, for you. Again, these are based on assessments that I've done in large number of countries. Um, we know now that increasing the condensate pH to 9.8 will gradually eliminate uh, a rest, we prefer to say, the film, the, um, the FAC at the tube entries, and the iron levels will reduce to what we look upon as the international suggested levels of between 5 and 10 ppb or less uh, 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 less than this uh, amount and these are and these have been documented by uh, a reducing daisy in index what we find is that many organizations um, uh, don't provide uh, sufficient detailed documentation before and after the application so that we can make so that we can make these comparisons. And so in terms of uh, the film forming substances, we are trying to get organizations to take much, much more care in require it uh, when a film forming substance is added so that you can avoid the problems that I've indicated. So if anybody wants to see what needs to be done, you can review the IAPS uh, guidance documents, uh, we, we call this a section eight review because it's covered in section eight of those documents. So this is a very, uh, sh a very quick um, in, in introduction um, to, um, to the chemistry and corrosion section. And I'm interested if, um, if anybody has any comments and questions, I, I tried to cover some of the uh, some of the questions that were that were sent in, but um, but but I, I don't know. There might be some more. So it looks like um, it looks like uh, Mohammed has has another question. So Mohammed, please go ahead. <coughs> I'm Mohammed Sharif from Egypt. Hi, Barry. Uh, Hi. 
How are you? Fine, and you? Uh, I'm very يعني, happy to listen to you about this and, uh, يعني, presentation. Uh, cool. But I, 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 uh, I understand from your side uh, if, if, if S is like uh, Mr. Chemist. Means when I, I use this type of the chem, the substance, how you can know what is the range of dosing? How you can uh, know what is the uh, analysis required to 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 measure it? And uh, any any place I can measure uh, dosing it or something. Yeah, Mohammed, they are very long and 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 complicated questions you can uh, you can see those they are very comprehensively covered in the iaps uh, film forming substance documents um to to uh, how to how to initiate the approach to using film forming substances to check whether the uh, whether the transported iron levels are within the international guidance levels to check whether the um, to check whether the deposits in the HP evaporator are are excessive or not and uh, and then how to and where to add the film forming substance and uh, depend depending upon what it is uh, as I uh, as I showed you there's 10 there's 10 different uh, there's 10 different uh, possible types of them so you've got to use the analytical facilities that would address that particular uh, 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 that particular type, and uh, and so uh, some of, some of those are, some of those are covered in the in the uh, film forming substance documents, and, uh, and and some of them are being introduced uh, gradually. We've been seeing them at the uh, film forming substance conferences. Thanks, Thank you. Looks like Sabello has a question. A comment. I, I, I would like to check if the film forming means of an influence on the conditions of the early condensate in the in the LP turbine, specifically the pH. Do they influence the pH better than ammonia? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, yes, I, I think uh, I, I think it, um, I indicated that it can be ammonia. It can be um, uh, an alkalizing amine if you if you if you would like, or it could be it could be uh, an all volatile treatment with the addition of a film forming substance at you know uh, 0.2 or 0.3 ppm level. Um, so any any of those are are uh, satisfactory. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Scott, I can't see the hands at the same time, but there's a uh, there's a question here from Yafim Kashler. Uh, if if you theme you hello if you want to if you want to ask a question or I can just raise it for you. Hi Barry. Uh, well, the question is the closest uh, pH in the lab that you are measuring is condensate before chemical injection. That's what the ACC is seeing, but we don't yes. really have much control of it. We can we have control over condensate after chemical injection, but yes. uh, uh, but you. Uh, I guess you're talking about 9.8 in the ACC, right? Yes, and and as a yes, because because that's the interfacial science that takes place between the fluid and the metal that's in the ACC, and as we as we talked, um, as we talked when I made a visit to your plant, um, it's very it, it's very important that that. That you don't just look upon that the guidance as a guidance that you can take and use in your plant. You 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 use that guidance as a starting point to monitor the iron levels, and it's the iron. It's really the iron levels that tell you whether whether you you've still got that FAC at the tube entries, or whether you're arresting it. Uh, 
let's see. Or, um, see any uh, Scott? Is there anybody with a hand up? Let's see. Uh, Seth Swecky, what about Seth Swecky? Good day, good day, Barry, and thanks for the presentation. Oh, yeah. it's great to see you. Yeah, and good to uh, see you again. Uh, this is the track Pala for those that don't know from ESCOM South Africa. Uh, Barry, it's it's just puzzling when you showed that um, application of film film forming. I mean, uh, substances do assist in terms of reducing the DASI index and also improving the corrosion rate in the ACC. But I just don't understand why will the application of these substances increase the boiler deposits? Uh, I just I don't understand because I, my thinking was it will reduce iron transport into the boiler, but as you see, it is the opposite in the HRC, I mean, as, as G's. Why, why will this be like this? Yeah, you, you've got a, You've got some in, 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 in indirect situations. That's okay. You know, you've got the 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 DC is used uh, be, before and afterwards, hopefully, and so you so you can you can in, you can indicate what the current what the current situation is, and then what you have to do is you have to relate uh, relate that change, uh, hopefully before you do that inspection, to uh, if you have a DC change from four to two or four to one. Then you've got a major change in the iron transport, and we know, um, and you know very well, that if you reduce the iron transport for your for your units, you'll reduce the amount of deposit in in the water walls, whether it's supercritical or or subcritical, and and also you will reduce it for combined cycles. Combined cycles in the HP evaporator are exactly the same, but yeah. but but the the we're we're trying we're trying to get. A better relationship between the daisy and the actual iron itself, but it, but as you can imagine, it's quite it's quite difficult to do that. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Mohammed has a Mohammed has another question. Uh, yes, Barry, about the level of uh, iron. You said about the level of iron you can uh, in ECC uh, power plant you can increase from 5 to uh, 10 PBB instead of the normal power plant is around 2 to 3, yes. Uh, but uh, in actually when you uh, working with ECC, the level of iron is more than 20. Uh, we, we, we use all type of treatment to decrease it, but very difficult, especially for uh, LP uh, section. Yeah, just uh, I need uh, if you have any any uh, kind of action to decrease this type of level of iron. And the iron and the iron um, with an ACC, Mohammed. Yes, ACC. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you. So maybe maybe you. Uh, but in the past, uh, we've seen that uh, we get the best results uh, from an ACC in terms of iron levels when there's a, uh, when there's a filter. And uh, it, it seems that the, the optimum is to use a five micron uh, absolute and, uh, and, and then you'll get, and then you'll get down to the levels that are published in, in international guidelines like IAPS to suggest that you can get less than 10 PPB of iron coming for in the condensate from the ACC. But uh, in, in units that don't have uh, a filter or don't have uh, a polisher like a Powdex uh, system, then you may, you may not be able to, you may not be able to meet that. Um, and so again, you would have to monitor it and see, just like I mentioned to Afim, you would have to monitor it to see, to see uh, what level uh, of pH um, in in the condensate will give you the lowest level of, of iron. Thanks, very thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, so Scott and Andy, I don't see any others. If any others come in, we can answer them again in the same context that we that we did for Andy, and then 
Um, we should work, stay approximately on time now. Okay. All right, Scott. Uh, we are ready to move to the next one. Is that you, Andy? You're going to be yep. uh, presenting. Yep. yep. Okay. See if I can get this quicker this time. We got it. Got it. Okay. Hopefully it'll change. All right. So there was quite a bit of interest in performance. Uh, there always is in performance of the ACC, especially in warm weather, uh, because everyone has a problem with this. So I'm going to do a quick, quick overview, and then we'll discuss and hopefully get input from uh, you experts out there. Uh, performance uh, is an issue simply because it's, well, it, the air is less efficient and higher temperature and uh, more difficult to cool with than water. So again, the big structure is is um, necessary to, to maximize uh, cooling, but it's not uh, not enough to get what we need in, in hot weather. And no, no size of an ACC would be enough to, when it's 100 degrees, to cool the condensate down to get a, a decent back pressure. I'm talking Fahrenheit when I say 100 degrees. Um, this is an example of on um, the left side, uh, back pressure, turbine exhaust pressure uh, goes up when the temperature goes up. And on the right side, correspondingly, the, the output uh, the gross and net megawatts goes down at the ambient temperatures. Uh, and then here's a comparison between uh, wet bulb and dry bulb at, at uh, wet bulb. You can maintain good cooling even in in warm weather and dry bulb. Uh, there's uh, definitely a shortage when when we compare it to the wet bulb. Um, evaporative wet cooling support is really, uh, in my opinion, I think it's I think it's a fact, but uh, it's my opinion for sure that that it's the only way to provide full load generation during hottest temperatures. Uh, there are other incremental ways to improve, improve uh, cooling, but they're not, none of them will get to, to the point that you would need to, to lower your back pressure. Uh, to really get the back pressure low enough to generate uh, full power, you have to have a, a cooler condensate. You have to bring the temperature down more. Uh, one of the ways this is done is with uh, spray misting. It, everyone thinks this sounds like an easy way to uh, to get some cooling. Uh, this is just kind of a rough a photo of a rough uh, system where uh, people just put some nozzles and sprayed some water in. Uh, this is a more refined one. So I have a I have it running. You can see very nice. Um, distribution of misting uh, but even that is is uh, there's a deficiency because the water a lot of the water doesn't get up to the fins it uh, it con condenses collects and drops back to the ground if you're under a uh, ACC when it's a spray misting you'll get wet to some extent and the other drawback of the misting is it requires uh, demineralized water you cannot be putting minerals onto the uh, fin tubes, at least not for any length of time without causing scaling and trouble. This is an example of a, a retrofit that was done uh, where essentially a, a little condenser on the left and a coolie with a little cooling tower on the right was uh, sized to fit into the system to to bring it to full load during during the hottest temperature. So this is a this is a, a practical and effective way. It's just a matter of, of whether it's cost effective for, for your particular needs. Notice on the left that uh, it's simply the connection to the, to the main steam exhaust duct is simply a, a large pipe uh, from the condenser and then the, the steam will go where it needs to. Uh, this looks simple and uh, the concept is simple, but just want to warn you that there are, there are uh, 
concerns that need to be addressed about where the flow is going and and how that how that might take away from the rest of the flow. Uh, for instance, I, I worked with a, a hybrid cooled system for a while, and and they always would run the the air cooled system and get the steam distributed through the entire system before they would would start up the water cooled system, or else it would it would uh, trend towards the water cooled system and and uh, and never get through the entire air cooled system. Uh, one other um, approach that I, I don't believe it's been put in an application, but there are, are a couple of OEMs that have designs on this is a deluge cooling. And, and in this case, it's like taking one part of an ACC row and, and essentially getting uh, flooding it with water and then recirculating that water. So it's, it's really evaporative overall. But, uh, but it gets good contact between the water and the tubes, direct contact. Uh, some of the other options that have been done that are not going to get you full load but could, could cause improvement are the expansion of the ACC. So here you can see a, a third row was added to these, uh, these two. Uh, my, my understanding was that that uh, provided something like a 7% improvement on the the uh, generation in hot weather and uh, was kind of borderline on on whether it was cost effective but it that's that's one approach the ACC could be expanded more more air cooling uh, fan up rate so running the fans at a higher speed putting in some uh, newer motors can can cause improvement but again whether it whether it uh, how far it will get towards getting your full load or how much you actually hope to get out of it is is an issue. Uh, keeping the tubes clean is obviously a, a factor. Uh, it's a maintenance factor. It's, it's something you can do because everyone has a, a either a tube cleaning system or the option of hiring someone to clean it. And that needs to be done to uh, keep the system optimal just to keep it at design. Um, don't try to interpret these, they're just colored pictures, but uh, air binding, so air and leakage in itself can be a, a res resolving the air and leakage can uh, can be a uh, necessary maintenance improvement, just like uh, cleaning the fin tubes to, to maintain full, uh, full performance. Hot air recirculation uh, can be an issue if there's a wind blowing, see wind coming in from the left, uh, the hot exhaust going out the top, over on the right, some of that can uh, be pulled back into the fan and and obviously bringing hot air in is going to uh, cause a drop in efficiency. There may be uh, uh, wind screens or other other uh, equipment that can help with this, avoid this. Gaps, these may be m relatively minor issues, but um, I've seen cases where people would leave the doors open on the ACC uh, into the fan rooms and and the air would blow out the door rather than all going through the fin. Just anything that's uh, incremental can be helpful. It's not going to get uh, full load, but during hot weather, you should be especially cautious to make sure these are optimized. And this is another another item. If a fan is not operating, whether it's out for maintenance or whatever, uh, you have to think about the cool air coming in on fans one and three here. Uh, and uh, the hot air coming out the top, some of it can be pulled back down through the fan that's off and then and it's just another form of recirculation. So uh, not much you can do about it except get the, the fan that's off fixed as quickly as possible. Um, this is something I've seen at a couple of units of bent fins. Again, not a lot you can do to fix these and, and not uh, probably a huge issue, but just all these issues can, can add up and should be optimized to the extent possible. Okay, so summary of this is just that uh, these ACCs are subject to significant operating inefficiencies and there are variety of poor performance improvements available and these should be evaluated for cost effectiveness. Okay, so the, uh, the items that we received, questions we received on this topic, uh, one is hot weather performance improvements, tips, tricks, trouble shooting. So I showed, a, I showed a few of these, but would be interested if you've got other 
other things that you do in hot weather to uh, try to maximize performance or or uh, any any systems you're looking into that that might do that uh, so I'd appreciate any any input on that right now Hey, Andy, it's John Baldach. Hey, John. Uh, I would just make a comment on, on, you showed one slide that effectively was talking about the effect of wind on ACC performance. And you showed that primarily as recirculation. And we've done measurements on, on a variety of ACCs with the wind blowing. And while recirculation is, is an issue, the major issue is the effect the wind going under the ACC has on the performance of the fans. Fans like to see the inlet air coming in uniform and parallel, and if you've got wind howling underneath it, it doesn't. And that's, in just in general terms, we always thought that the effect on fan performance was about two-thirds of the performance reduction with recirculation accounting for the other one-third. The reason that's important is that the kind of screens you might put up to prevent the wind effects, the, the way you design the fans, if you're trying to stop the effect, on, or the way you design the screens and locate them, if you're trying to stop the effect of the wind on fan performance, it's slightly different than the fan, than the screen location you would use to reduce recirculation. So, I don't know that I have any general guidance on that subject, but you know, when the vendors are telling you where to put the fans, you ought to listen to them or where to put the screens rather. Right. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's a really good, really good point. I didn't put in my, my introduction, but I also like to comment that we, we do have, uh, thanks to Gary Mursky getting, getting this started, but, uh, we do have, um, a guidance document on on wind issues with ACCs. It's it's uh, similar to the air and leakage document uh, sitting in my file, and and we're hoping to hoping to have that a lot more progressed by the by the fall meeting within the next month or so. Okay. Now Gary knows an awful lot about that stuff. He's climbed yep. on a lot of them with little wind monitors and everything. Else. Yep. <laughs> Okay, uh, any, if anyone comes up with uh, any of these I, comments, I do have that's one fine. question, if I may. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So um, my question is, um, throughout the, the pictures that you have shown, it, it seems that the, uh, the all the water injection is down um, upstream the fan. And I was just wondering um, whether an injection done downstream the fan between the fan and the heat exchanger, the condenser itself, uh, would be um, if of more benefit since there uh, that eliminates the uh, erosion problems from uh, resulting from the droplets on the fan themselves or would the performance be uh, less um if we if the the nozzles are shifted from upstream the fan to downstream the fan thank you Andy are you with us Lost him, Scott. I think. Yeah, I think he might have. Uh, we might have lost him there. Well, again, uh, this is John Malbach again, and I've done some of these spray tests. I think a couple of the slides that Andy used of the of the spray underneath the fans were from a, from tests that we did. Uh, it's an interesting question. I never really thought of putting the spray downstream of the fan and upstream of the uh, condenser tubes. 
Uh, I mean, the real, the purpose of putting the water in there is not to wet the surface of the, of the fins. The purpose is to let the spray evaporate and re get you some adiabatic cooling of the air going into the fins. And I think you give it a little more time to do that if you spray upstream of the fan. On the other hand, Andy's comment that a lot of the water that you spray ends up in the next zip code and not in the not in the cell that you're trying to cool. So that's a, it's a thought. I don't know. Might be worth a little fast. I think I com can comment on that as well. Uh, we do install quite a few, say, um, fogging misting systems. And uh, most of them, we have the nozzles above the fan. And if you see the the flow of the air and the mist, it is um, because of the turbulence, it is very effective. And as long as you use them in water, there's practically no problem with the, with the fence. And um, I would say 95% of all the water evaporates. However, what we normally install is um, humidity sensors and a um, frequency inverter for the for the pump. So we actually increase the relative humidity to say about say 96, 97%. And if the water is uh, excessive, we actually uh, control down the, the pump in order to have less water into the air. Because if you have too much water in the air, it starts raining. Uh, you lose uh, valuable, uh, say, dam in water, which is uh, doing nothing. It just drips down like a uh, like uh, shower uh, to the floor, and it is absolutely no use. So we actually, if we install these systems, we increase the relative humidity as much as possible. And we have the, say, the mist evaporate as much as possible in order to create a maximum relative humidity and therefore having, say, an evaporative process, cooling down the air. And the cooling down, what we have then in centigrade is between six and say about nine degrees C, depending a little bit on the ambient conditions, of course. And I must say that works quite well. We have a few clients in the UK who are after many years of operation, I asked them, uh, gents, uh, are you still using it? We don't hear anything. And they said, yes, of course we're using it. Without that, we won't survive the summer. Um, uh, so that part of, uh, say, the uh, performance improvements works quite well. And especially now in this, uh, say, period with high prices for power, um, we're having quite a few inquiries for new systems. So uh, that is actually the idea, uh, to have water evaporate until everything is evaporated and then have the maximum, say, cooling effect of that quantity of water. I'm, I'm sorry, just to confirm that I understood correctly. So this means that you inject, uh, your experience says that it's better to inject it downstream, the, the fan? Yes, 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 yes. Um, we have, we made some tests with uh, some nozzles uh, under the fan and test with nozzles above the fan. And if you do them under the fan, uh, most of the time, because the distance to the fan blades is relatively short, so um, you, you don't have a complete evaporation process at that point, and uh, you wet the fans. If you do it on top of the fan, so it's have downstream, at the outlet of the fan, um, actually the, the turbulence of the air is quite intense. And you see that the plume from the nozzles disappears very quickly. Uh, if you have a plume of say one to one and a half meter, it is a long plume. So you should actually have nozzles that have, do not have too much capacity, uh, rather have more nozzles installed. And then uh, you have a cloud of mist uh, appearing from the nozzles and uh, it disappears very quickly. Uh, maybe for the um, for the uh, session in uh, September, I can try to get some pictures of that system. But it is um, our experience is that uh, 
leave the fan as it is. Don't make it wet. And uh, use the turbulence of the of the air to mix the air as good as possible with the uh, with the mist, and then you have the maximum uh, result. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Francois has a question. He can unmute himself. Yeah. Um, hi all, it's Francis de Pierre from also from ESCOM. Uh, I just want to follow up on something which John said a while back is that uh, um, the effect in wind conditions is not only his circulation, also fan, uh, the fan uh, effect on the fans. And that's also our experience. So um, on one of our utilities, one of our plants there, um, the fan stall margin is about 10%. In other words, the um, the stall margin of fan from a design point of view is if, if, if the pressure drop across the fan or the pressure increase across the fan increases by about 10% from design, the fan would go into stall. In other words, it wouldn't deliver any more of, uh, airflow, um, although it still rotates, but it, it, uh, there's no airflow. So we've done lots of um, CFD studies in this, in this respect. And um, uh, we we um, with different fan characteristics of fans with a higher stall margin, and in fact the newer plants we built with a much higher stall margin on the fans. And and what we've done now is we've got the contract to replace all the fans on one of the units. It's a multiple unit um, ACC um, station. We'll replace the fans on one unit with with improved characteristic fans. So we are to select the fans. Obviously, you don't have to replace the motor or gearbox. The starting currents and all that is still in check. Um, so we hopefully it will be installed in a year or so. So maybe later on we can report what what difference that that makes in windy conditions. So we will compare the modified unit to the the unmodified units and see if we can um, you know what what performance improvement we get we we hope it will be substantial but we will measure it thanks thank you thanks well any other comments scott i don't see any hands raised or any other questions so uh let's um, let's move on to the next section if rishi is there Yeah, Rishi. Is he here? Rishi's here. He might just have to change his uh, microphone input. Okay. Andy made it back. Uh, so I'm not sure if Andy had anything else to add. Um, no, I was making a few comments, but they didn't get heard. So that's all right. It was, I heard a lot of good comments from other people. I was just, I was going to mention that, that the idea of not putting the, the uh, misting on a, every uh, fan is also potentially good. If you had a more efficient misting system, you wouldn't have to put on every fan. And that could be, uh, that could be very useful. Right. It looks looks like Rishi might be having some audio issues, Andy. So do you want to uh, do you and Barry want to take the uh, the remainder of the questions that were submitted from our participants today? Um, yeah, Rishi, if you can uh, figure it out, you're welcome to to join in. But uh, uh, Rishi prepared, uh, I think, about five slides here that have uh, other questions. These are more towards the operation and maintenance, but could be in any category they didn't really fit as a, a single topic so uh, we can go through these and yeah and any comment anyone has Barry is is fine as well um, can you guys hear me now yes oh okay cool good deal take over All okay right. go ahead so I'm hitting 
share, it says you can't share content unless the host or a co-host or the presenter makes you the presenter. We're seeing, did you put that up, Scott, or did Rishi? Yeah, Rishi, do you see the slides, uh, your slides on the screen? Uh, no. Okay. It wasn't. You can sh you can share them. Uh, you have uh, you have that ability now. Okay. okay. All good. Okay. All right. So this section is essentially uh, the comments and the questions that we got um, when you guys registered so the idea here is that we'll go through each question one by one um try to narrow it down by topic um and so we're gonna wait for you guys to uh, chime in and if there are any comments we'll, we'll make those comments so the first sort of section is um on wind speed um and the wind affecting ACC design. So the first question is, is the wind speed and direction normally considered in a new ACC design? Is this included in uh, performance guarantees? Has uh, anyone had experience with that? Like newer power plants? Yeah, and I think we'd like to hear either way if it's uh, if that's not considered, that would be of interest as well. What this there are people out there who know a lot more about this than I do, I think. But this is this the ACC is normally aligned in conjunction with what people know about the prevailing winds and speed and direction, but the performance guarantees. The issue is with the is with the, the standard test, and the standard tests normally require that the tests be run at wind speeds less than some number, three meters per second or something. And so it kind of takes wind off the table when it comes to the performance test. And I think that's true. There, there's a. You know, there's an ASME performance test. There's a uh, CTI performance test. There's the one left over from RWE, I think, in Germany from years ago. And they all have a, a maximum wind speed at which the performance test is conducted. And it, it really. Yeah, that's correct. So what about the first part of that? Uh, any any other John? John? Uh... So that's normally normally considered, and I think it is. But I I think sometimes there's other considerations about what fits into the location. But uh... well, of course, I mean you put it where you can put it. But they do try to line it up so that the wind is is you know, not blowing directly across the thing. They'd rather have it aligned. And they try to put it someplace where there aren't big things around that. You know, cause uh, distortion of the wind before it gets to the ACC. It's all very site specific. There's a couple of comments and questions. Uh, uh, Francois, Francois Dupree, had his hand up. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, it's very difficult to enforce this in a contact uh, because the contactor would like to know what is the rest of the buildings in the boiler, whatever structures and it, we we tried it and and it's um, well we did do it but it's extremely it's not I don't think it's very practical um, and uh, you can obviously override the test goes and, and say you allow for high wind speed uh, because normally it's it's limited as John explained but it's um, it's quite challenging to to try and enforce this um, so uh, I, I would rather go some other route and. And describe some minimum wind features that the ICC must have to make it more robust against wind. Thanks. 
you. Thank you, Francois. There's a question from uh, Jerish. Jerish. Right. Uh, whenever the wind speed increase, we see that, uh, you know, on the thermography until that point of time, uh, the separation line is very clear and uh, the air stagnation was under control. But the moment the high wind speed happens, uh, the air is spread across the SEC everywhere. Uh, if we can uh, reduce the air entrapment, in the high wind speed, do you think we can uh, improve the performance on high wind speed uh, conditions or uh, how to improve the air removal effectiveness uh, during high wind speed without getting trapped? So you're talking about the entrapment in the ACC tubes, the air and leakage entrapment? Air and leakage is same uh, during high wind speed and low wind speed. Uh, but the moment high wind speed happens, the air is spread across the SSC. I believe like it will have some impact on the performance. Hmm. Is there a technique uh, that we can improve that? To improve the you know the way the air is sucked. Is there any technique that was developed uh, to prevent the entrapment in high wind speeds? There's a there's a comment from Ralph. Hmm. He's saying ASME testing five meter per second is one of the most stringent requirements in the contract. I guess or if you're requiring them to meet the ASME spec, five meters per second is accounted for There's another comment underneath that um by adam he says our acc was placed strategically for a predominant northwest wind direction although we have found that it is south winds that hurt us during warm and hot weather and not the north northwest wind here in canada so i mean there's like stuff that can't really be accounted for even when you do design an ACC. So the, the Northwest winds were probably the strongest and the most uh, noticeable, but uh, but not really a priority necessarily. John has another comment. Two ACCs I looked at showed wind direction, had a large effect on heat transfer. Nearby structures had an influence as well. Yes. So I guess the sort of the question underneath that is why does wind speed affect ACCs? I think John kind of uh, explained that really well is you want the wind, you know, if the wind's really strong, it could just go underneath the ACC and not get sucked in the ACC. I know we had one of our plants up by Reno um, have that issue where uh, during the during the summer, uh, when the winds blow really hard, it kind of bypasses the ACC and then they get derated. Uh, the high back pressure, the ACC can't um, get the heat exchange needed. Um, so. When when speed eventually does I guess play a role. So moving on from that topic, what is general experience with wind induced blade cracking? So when the blade cracks, then there's a investigation to consider why and and the wind may be blamed for it, maybe uh, responsible. Has there been a lot of experience with that? I know I've heard some stories in the past. He's 
got a hand raised from Gary Mursky. So Gary, please uh, comment. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'd like to handle several of these uh, questions. You know, a lot of the older ACCs, as John mentioned, there's a German code, um, VTI, and wind speed direction there. I mean, wind speed was uh, three meters per second, which was the code limit for many of the old air cooled condensers built in the States. And um, I'm going to lose track of time here, but then ASME came out with their test code, which went up to five meters per second. So that's that's more the norm now in the States is five meters per second for the design. Um, the next question, why does wind speed affect ACCs? Uh, Rashi uh, mentioned the uh, the effect of bypassing the the windward side fans, so it doesn't really matter, um, you know, where the wind is coming from. It's going to affect whatever the windward side fans are. So if it's hitting the long axis, you're uh, affecting more fans, and uh, there's been a lot of studies done by uh, Stellenbosch University. Uh, and I can recall uh, Dr. Kroger's studies uh, where he published charts showing that windward side fans could have as, as low a flow as 90% loss in airflow at nine meters per second. So that's, that's the main reason why uh, wind affects ACCs. And uh, there were a friend, uh, Cosimo Bianchini at the uh, Galebreak at the uh, Ergon research, we have done together over 30 CFD analysis of uh, AC of power plants with ACCs, where we study the wind effects on uh, on the buildings and how the uh, the jet streams will affect the flow of air into the air cooled condenser. Uh, but one of the um, general factors are is that again on the windward side you're creating a lot of turbulence, which is creating a recirculation. It's a little, little hard to picture it, but you're actually pulling it because of the vortexing underneath the wind wall. You're getting air pulled down through the heat exchanger on the windward side. So you're getting recirculation, plus you're losing uh, fan performance. And that vortexing also induces a blade stress an alternating blade stress where they have been papers uh, presented uh, showing the uh, effects of uh, wind induced blade stress, which creates mm -hmm. blade cracking on fiberglass fan blades. So the next question went about wind baffles. That's uh, really what Gale Breaker specializes in. So we'll do a CFD analysis, look at optimal configurations for uh, wind screens, whether it's on the perimeter or a combination of the perimeter and baffles underneath the ACCs as a cruciform style, um, which impacts the airflow. It kind of, you get better control of airflow into the uh, windward fans that way, windward side fans and the middle fans. So you just get better airflow and uh, you have less pressure losses and which gets you to your, your sweet point of your efficiency on your fan blades. So that's Gary, uh, Gary, I have a question. Uh, have, have you said mentioned done some 30 studies? Have you done any CFDs uh, pre-construction? We're never contacted then, Andy. We're only contacted when uh, uh, they have a problem. Okay, I'm I'm just curious about what the criteria is for. Uh, I mean, the wind direction and speed, I guess, would be the basic criterion, and CFD would require uh, detailed knowledge of the structure. So maybe it's not that possible. Well, we're we're now into our second situation, where uh, we have plant data, and uh, and we're looking at wind speed and wind direction. And we said, gee, that's strange. We, we evaluated the uh, 
prevailing wind from the northeast, and you're saying you're having issues now from the southeast. And they looked at their anemometer, and their anemometer had been rotated. <laughs> and, it, and it's the second time this has happened, it happened to a set of plant in uh, New Jersey, which I'm familiar with. I says, you know, normally the southwest wind is prevailing in the summer. And they were showing that uh, from their plant data that it was coming from a different direction, prevailing wind. Yeah, but, you know, but they would put the screens on the wrong side. No, they never put the screens. The gentlemen, I must excuse me. There's someone else waiting for me. Okay, I hope to meet you soon. And I'll see you in September. All right. Thanks, Hub. Appreciate yeah. your input. Okay. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you. I have uh, one other follow up on. I had a question recently uh, with in tar terms of blade cracking. Uh, someone was at telling me their the blades that they received before installation showed cracks. I'm just wondering if anyone has seen any uh, has seen that had supplied blades that had cracked prior to installation. And I'll give five seconds and that's fine if you haven't, but I'd send a note if you have. I just wanted to ask that for someone. Well, Andy, I can I can comment on that too. You know, okay. I've got about 50 years in the industry. Yeah. As an OEM and uh, seen it all. But like uh, one of the fan manufacturers uh, makes their blades in two halves. And there's okay. a theme. And we've observe what we call blade cracking, which was then defined as a cosmetic issue. Uh, so it looks like a crack, but there's like a bondo that holds the blades together. Okay. And, and it looks like there's a seam, so you would think that there's a crack. You might think that there's Yeah, a okay. That's a good good thing to check out. Okay, we hit, uh, got a last... comment from uh, Chris. You can unmute yourself. Hey Andy, this is Chris Lazenby at Southern Company, and and I was just going to comment the same. Not so much on ACCs, but the as Gary attested to, the blade fabrication is similar. We have had areas where we've observed cracks in newly supplied blades, and uh, these were were defined as sort of resin rich areas um, where the the cracks were running sort of vertically on the leading edge. It wasn't a seam like Gary was talking about, but uh, uh, what that led to over time was some of the uh, the resin kind of falling off of the the blade, and so that that was a again it was a manufacturing issue that we were able to get corrected. Uh, okay, that was was something that has happened to us uh, okay. on a few occasions. All right, appreciate that, Chris. I just had a follow up question for Gary. So. So when baffles and controls, um, so when you're when you're asked to when you're called in for something like that, um, are you able to completely mitigate the effects of when? Um, and then is like is the, is the performance like the the improvement? Is that are you able to quantify that yes. before implementing the uh, the baffles and the screens? Yes. So that's exactly what we do in our CFE analysis. Um, one recent study has just talked in terms of uh, the terminology that's used is we kind of look at the uh, performance deficiency without windscreens, and then we'll compare to the improvement of thermal performance with windscreens. And uh, one project that didn't go ahead uh, we had a 75% effectiveness. So in other words, we recouped 75% of the loss that was predicted, which is pretty good. I mean, to, to get somewhere at around 50%. Again, it, it's a function of the, uh, the wind speed. Um, Adam was on there before. And our analysis at his facility was like the highest predominant wind speed that I've that we've had 19 meters per second. Nice. So that 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 is pretty high. Yeah. 
Well, Gary, this is John Waldrich again. As you recall, we spent a lot of time at Caithness a few years ago with their, their screens that could be run up and down. I'll never forget it. <laughs> no, it was a great summer. Are people, has that, has that been pursued? Do you guys put in the, the, the movable screens now? Oh, absolutely, John. Okay. I mean, I haven't paid much attention to, to wind effects on ACCs for the last many years. Oh, shame on you. <laughs> you, know, you don't call me. <laughs> well, I can say the same. Yeah, but, no, uh, yeah, yeah, no, we, uh, the screens went in. Uh, actually, were being installed during Hurricane Sandy uh, back in 2012. Um, they, uh, you know, after some of the research that we had done with uh, Howden, uh, I went, I thought you were there too. We went back for that a meeting to kind of review with the plant the, uh, the results. Yeah, I was there. And we, and we rolled the screens up to uh, the half of the height. Well, they, were, they were installed at half height and we went up to 25% of the height and they have remained at that position ever since. Yeah, I remember hearing that story, but I'm saying for plants, for ACCs built since then that you guys have put screens on, have they all been fixed or have you put in some, some movable screens? Never another well for cooling towers. We have done uh, roll up screens uh, like for plume baited cooling towers. Uh, okay. um, but for um, air cool condensers, they've all been fixed. Okay. All right. Thanks. I appreciate that. Anything on the variable fan speed control? Any uh, any suggestions? What uh, has been helpful or not? I can speak for uh, NV Energy. I know we have a project coming up uh, in the next. A uh, couple of years to change all of our fans to VFDs. I guess the justification for that was just the starts and stops as we cycle. Um, you're better off using VFDs, and then you know just the times when we go down on load, um, you're better off uh, you know using a set of fans rather than turning you know, the fans on and off. Yep, that sounds good. All right, let's see what we got next. <laughs> okay, uh, general ACC cleaning, best cleaning method for ACCs. I'll comment with what I know about this. Um, the degreaser has been, we looked into quite a bit uh, a few years back. It was uh, thought that the gearbox oil, which is common in many ACCs, unfortunately, uh, would require that to, to be removed. Um, we uh, found in at the unit I was working with that, that the water seemed to, it didn't necessarily remove that, that grease, but it seemed to restore performance uh, pretty fully and the grease the grease seemed to deteriorate over time in the sunlight or whatever I don't know but but it didn't seem like the degreaser was as necessary as we had thought early on uh, the other issue is if you're if you use a degreaser and you're blowing it to the ground uh, then your water degreaser evaporates and you've got grease on the ground uh, may not be visible but uh, I'm sure it's measurable it's a little little bit of a concern there and demon water is not necessary for fin tube cleaning it's fine it's it's good if you got it i know some places use that uh, something typical of tap water is is probably good you wouldn't run to run tap water on it uh, you know for months and months and let the solids build up but to to do a cleaning for uh, a few minutes periodically it's not a not a big deal but uh and be sure you check with your your acc oem on on water quality they recommend to make sure i'm not telling you something that doesn't match uh, in terms of water collection containment and my understand last i knew there were two states that required uh, water collection from acc cleaning there may be more um 
I'd be interested if anyone has comments. This is in the U.S., of course. I'm, I'd be interested if there's a difference in other places in the world or or uh, other areas of the U.S. in terms of re being required to collect that fin tube cleaning water. Yeah, I can comment on that. Um, we were involved in the uh, Dighton plant, which is in Rhode Island, and they had a company policy that um, because they were next to a uh, an environmental area that they had to collect the uh, the cleaning water uh, so it didn't run into the environmental area which was a swamp so i, I don't know if that's one of the states andy uh rhode island no hadn't heard that yeah and as far as the uh, best cleaning methods i mean most of the cleaning methods i'm aware of is like an a-frame that can be either manually uh, pushed or be motorized to go up and down the street and they're normally fitted with uh, high pressure spray tubes that shoots water down in you know through the a-frame and uh, cleans it that way and the pressure is normally around a thousand psi or the pumps at grade are around a thousand psi so that would be as opposed to clean to shooting the water up um, yeah i've also heard of uh, baking soda being used right yeah uh, baking soda was used as kind of an in ingredient to to uh in particulate form to help remove stuff i i um we do have an ACCUG document on guidance document on this, so um, it's pretty it's pretty thorough, but doesn't really talk about water collection or containment. Well, one state was Connecticut. I thought the other was Washington State, but I'm not not for sure about that. Well, that power plant I was referring to in Rhode Island, um, it was sold, and the new owner didn't have that same corporate right policy. Yeah, so they, they didn't have to collect the water anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we why don't we move on, Rishi? We just got a few minutes. Uh, see if we can do maybe one more slide. Okay. Uh, the most important maintenance item to maintain for ACC performance. I, you know, I would I would comment strictly for performance. Uh, keeping the tubes clean is is perhaps a high priority. It, it depends on your areas. I've I've been in areas where they clean it. Said so they cleaned it once every three years, and they they get very little dust on their ACC. But generally, at least annually is is recommended. And uh, but any other thoughts on that? Yeah, as far as performance, I mean, definitely the surface has to be clean, but also I've seen, I mean, if one of your fans are out, is out, you know, that can affect performance as well. Um, oh, yeah. You end up taking a D rate. So to make sure you have, you know, um, people doing uh, vibration analysis, have your techs doing your vibration analysis to predict any failures. And then uh, have you know the parts required to change it out in stock, and it ends up being expensive. But you're better off changing them out rather than changing them out, changing them out in during summer. It seems to me, left over from my listening to various user group meetings over the last many years, that gearboxes was the topic that came up more than anything else. And I, I mean, I don't maintain these things, so I don't know if that's true, but that's what I remember. Yeah, I guess whatever's whatever is going bad is the is the biggest issue. Uh, gearboxes are keeping the fans going is a high priority. Uh, keeping them clean is a high priority, and and minimizing air air and leakage can be a performance issue as well. So, I would go as, go with those. Um, any of these other items? Anyone have any uh, comments on? Uh, so we're about to 
finish off, I wanted to make a couple of comments. So. Yeah, I'd like to add something, Andy, is uh, the project John referred to at Caithness on Long Island. Um, they had a, a map of uh, motor trips. So they were getting a lot of motor trips from vibration. And part of the screens, part of the uh, benefit of the screen design that was installed reduced that vibration problem. But the, the other side thing that we learned there was that, you know, because of noise restrictions at new power plants, um, you know, at the property line, normally it's like 60 or even less uh, dBA, uh, these fans are running at very low speeds, you know, usually under 100 RPM, um, less mm -hmm. than two hertz. And we've learned that uh, mechanical vibration switches aren't sensitive at those speeds. So at Caithness, they even had broken fan blades and the motors did not trip from mm. the from the vibration set up by a broken fan blade. Okay, good. I see a comment on the temperature for uh, efficient cleaning. I uh, that's you generally not considered uh, something that that we do is heat the cleaning water, or uh, or care about uh, what's on the steam side of the tube. It, it comes off uh, stuff comes off usually it's pretty easy to rinse off with a high pressure spray all right well we're we're right at the end um, um, and this is part of the thing I wanted to comment on is uh, is uh, any input anybody has on on this form, this is the first thing we've done of this type. Um, it was uh, meant to have discussion on issues of interest, and I would appreciate any comments and suggestions you could send to the steering committee, uh, including uh, whether you think whether this was a useful format, whether there's something you'd suggest changed, whether two hours is enough, uh, whether we should do it. Uh, periodically to cover more issues uh, in more depth just just any comments on how how this might go it's it's pretty easy to set up and run thanks Scott um, and uh, if, if there's uh, other issues the forum the ACCUG forum on the website has not been used a lot but it is available and um, people can respond to those also undermine the in-person meeting we have in, in Branford, Connecticut with a visit to uh, CPV's Toanic Energy Center that has an induced draft ACC. There are not very many of them around, so it's an opportunity to, to look at one. And uh, that's in September 12th to 15th, so coming up pretty soon. We're still finishing up on the agenda, but we've got some good a good basis for it at this point. I need to post that on the website as soon as I get it.